Uh, okay, you know, thanks. Uh, thank you for um, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, you know, I tried to select the best picture of Singapore in the evening and uh, with uh, Graal VM for Ruby. Um, and, uh, you know, just to introduce that, uh, you know, it's from Oracle. We are from Oracle Labs um, based in Singapore um, and we're working across uh, Asia Pacific Japan. Um, and uh, Ruby has been a uh, very, um, you know, a close and uh, dear to a lot of this work that is being done from uh, from Oracle Labs, right? So Oracle Labs was actually started um, as a successor to Sun Labs, and we're the research and development arm for Oracle. And uh, there are a lot of technologies within uh, Oracle Labs that we work on, things like machine learning, blockchain, and all that uh, from an engineering standpoint. Graal VM is um, the technology that uh, we have had, uh, you know, special focus in. Uh, you know, from the JVM standpoint, also for native images, as you will hear. Uh, and then also interpreters for different languages, and one of them being Ruby. Um, and so since the last one and a half years, we've had uh, uh, Graal VM go into enterprise mode with, uh, you know, full enterprise production readiness. Um, and also, of course, we have our uh, community uh, support, a community version going on, uh, as you can see on GitHub, and you can follow that and so forth. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to pause me, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll probably um, go through a couple of slides and then move into some demos uh, and then, you know, go back to some of the slides and things like that so we can keep it interactive. So just to say for our statement is, you know, some, some of it is forward-looking uh, capabilities and so forth, right? So, so um, one of the motivations that um, Graal VM was started initially was that there were these hurdles with multiple runtimes. Uh, there were uh, challenges where, you know, people were trying to devise this parallelism um, where they want to be able to work across different types of uh, runtimes, you know, where you had the uh, Java runtime, of course, built on Hotspot, and then JavaScript, Ruby, and R, you know, for different purposes, everybody has specialization, as we were hearing earlier that, you know, people have different solution skill sets. So processing frameworks have different types of bindings uh, for data and machine learning. Uh, likewise, also in the database, uh, you want to sometimes have Python, JavaScript calls, select statements, and so forth. Um, the, some of the other challenges that we see there is like performance penalty that happens. So when you're crossing over the, the boundary of one language to another, how many hundred times slower is it? Functional calls, um, you know, the mem is it the same memory address space and, and things like that. And then the other part is the management overhead, like a lot of heaps. Uh, you know, garbage collection issues, um, policies, and then bugs because you have to patch one and then, you know, you have another um, third-party dependency and things like that. You know, how do you, how do you do this? It becomes very costly, cumbersome to maintain this as you grow and scale and things like that, right? And, and not to even bring in things like your front end and so forth. So eight years ago, what happened was um, there was a project, actually almost uh, 10 years ago now, uh, there was this uh, project that started out with uh, Dr. Thomas and his team uh, and this concept of one VM to rule them all. And um, started out Oracle Labs. And so there's this very nice paper uh, that's written on that. Uh, if you wanted to see more about what is under the hood, like what's behind the scenes, the types of optimizations, all these things like, you know, uh, partial evaluation technique, inlining, and so forth. Why is the performance so good? Like you will see later, okay, this is regular Ruby. Now I'm running it with, uh, with, with Graal VM, uh, Truffle Ruby, and it's so much faster. Behind the scenes, what's going on and so forth. A lot of it is actually written there um, and, and things like that. So you can learn a lot from that as well, right? So, so from Graal uh, VM perspective, we always think of um, the... Um, you know, a love for all languages. Uh, there was a nice Twitter uh, feed and so forth uh, where, you know, it was actually shown that, you know, we have, uh, you know, support for different interpreters. Um, and to recognize that, you know, in today's mixed environment, a lot of people have specialization in different types of languages. Uh, Java is, of course, uh, uh, you know, pretty significant. But, of course, the rising trend of, uh, you know, uh, things like, you know, JavaScript, Python, Ruby is also... Uh, very, very significant there and things like that. And then on the right, you can see, um, I didn't put the URL here, but, you know, you can actually go directly to github. Uh, and uh, slash oracle slash, um, uh, you know, uh, crowd VM, and you can actually see the, the different types of um, 
actively maintain lines of code that we have got. The Graal VM project is, is, is very active. Um, it's got now, I think, close to about 13. Last count was about 13,700 GitHub stars. So you can see in terms of the proportion of uh, the lines of code, you know, it's almost three, four million lines of code, almost uh, close to a million is uh, on Ruby. So it's a large part of it uh, as well. So of course, support for other languages and things like that as well. So the GraalVM <clears throat> ecosystem in terms of uh, architecture, we've got support for JVM languages, as I mentioned, you know, like things like Java, Scala, Kotlin, and Clojure and things like that. So, uh, and on the Truffle um, standpoint, what we call this language implementation layer, we've got support for JavaScript, Ruby, R, Python, and so long, so long is more on the C, C++, um, uh, area and things like that. So people do that through LLVM uh, bitcode uh, interpreter. Uh, and then of course it runs on GraalVM uh, compiler that is plugged into the hotspot through the JVM CI, which is the compiler interface, right? So that's kind of like a, you know, a simplified architecture in that sense. Now moving into Truffle Ruby, right? So, so what we've got is um, this high performance Ruby implementation, right, by Oracle Labs. And that's the logo I was kind of saying. I thought it's very catchy. Um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we've got uh, some interesting uh, work going on there. So it uses the GraalVM JIT compiler. GraalVM runs in, um, in two modes. Uh, one is uh, you, you've got the JIT mode, and of course you have AOT, which is ahead of time. And it targets full compatibility with uh, C Ruby, including C extensions. The open source is on GitHub. Um, that's the URL that you can actually follow and bring up. You'll be able to see the different uh, areas and demos and things like that. The one you're going to be seeing right now is on that. So it runs on two modes, right? Um, as I mentioned, uh, GraalVM is in in uh, in the classical sense is it, it runs in two modes. You know, you've got the JIT, where um, typically you know you have you know more complex, long-running workloads. So the JVM mode can interoperate with Java conveniently there. Um, and uh, also in native mode, right, which is the default here that you will see. Uh, it's compiled into AOT, which is ahead of time. It's a native uh, executable. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's a self, uh, um, everything is pre-compiled in that sense. So that's why you get a fast startup and the warm up and things like that. You'll see a benchmark that you run and even the low footprint. Uh, say, for example, you know, you're comparing startup, you're getting almost like, you know, two or three times difference. 25 milliseconds versus 48 and even lower footprint, like, you know, 60 megabytes uh, for your RSS uh, memory, right? Um, and just for a hell of a application and things like that. So it's compatibility with different types of uh, C Ruby 2.6, C extensions uh, is a, is a open SSL and, uh, you know, a lot of the different drivers and things like that. It can reuse a lot of the gem files with no changes. And so uh, today, from uh, Truffle Ruby standpoint, we are really close to the um, the specs uh, for completeness. It's about at ninety seven percent, and uh, you know compared to C Ruby and J Ruby and things like that. So all this is actually even shown there. Uh, let me just um, kind of uh, go through some uh, you know some of the um, different goals and status, right? So currently, you can run Ruby code faster. So it's doing great in a lot of CPU intensive benchmarks. Um, an interesting thing also is that you can run it in parallel. So you can run it in multi-threaded uh, mode. So there's no uh, limitation. There's no uh, Jill or rather the global interpreter lock for Ruby code, which is uh, uh, it's very welcome uh, by a lot of different engineers and things like that. And you can also do a lot of uh, cross-language debugging and profiling. So let me just, uh, on this note, kind of go into some of the, the demos, right? So, so what I've got um, here is essentially um, a, you know, just to share with you so you can follow. Can you see my um, browser screen here? Uh, yes. Here? Yes. Okay. So if uh, you wanted to follow this, the easiest way is uh, you just go to the GraalVM uh, site and you can actually download GraalVM and run it in parallel. It just takes a minute or so to, to download it. It's, it's not that long, actually. Uh, and then once you download it, you know, you just run uh, a GU install for your uh, for Truffle Ruby and you're already up and running. And then, you know, whatever gems that you need accordingly, because everything is self-contained within the Graal VM, right? All your Truffle Ruby and all that uh, logic and libraries and things like that. So assuming, you know, you have a code, something like this, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you wanted to write, say, an application where it has JavaScript in one language, but then now you realize there's a library that you need to run, which is a third-party library, right? So say, for example, you wanted to write your application converting CSS color name to hexadecimal and Node.js. 
um, but you wanted to use uh, Ruby color library. So you've got you know JavaScript, Express, and then uh, you know Polyglot. What we call here's how you mix and match code. We um, a single runtime on Graal VM, and then you know you can run it uh, using your you know uh, Ruby uh, and colors and, and things like that as well, right? So so this is where you are basically saying that uh, you know you want to be able to write your application, convert it, and then do some conversion. So you've got you specify some Ruby code as a string. And then we realize there's not much in it. We just require some libraries and you run the color script and so forth. So if we do that, we are, we are going to be running um, this and you install some gems. So we install the, the Ruby and JavaScript dependencies as you normally would. And here is the code. So if we run this, uh, you'll be able to see that um, uh, it supports that polyglot uh, method, right? So here is, uh, let me just show you what uh, version of Java this is on. So this is using uh, basically Graal VM, right? So the only thing that you do to set this up essentially is um, you change the home uh, path directory to Graal VM. So whatever you've been using before it could be like uh, any JDK or something like that. You just change it to this after you download it, and that's about it. So if I'm in that uh, directory, uh, I'm going to be running a um, node polyglot JVM for color server.js. And once that's done, you'll be able to see, you know, that color mechanism, right? Uh, that was actually um, by calling these methods from JavaScript. So even though they are Ruby objects and methods, we just pass them as a JavaScript. You can concatenate the result and so forth. So we're doing that here. And um, once this comes up, it's a, um, uh, your local host, you know, we'll just uh, basically go there and we'll be able to see the color mechanisms, right? Then we can actually change them and things like that as well. So. Okay, let's go to that. And it's the browser here. So let's go to that. So you'll see different colors and uh, color schemes and things like that, right? You know, you can then go into, you know, whatever, blue, green, and things like that as well. So, so this is how, you know, it's a very basic example, but, you know, how you're able to install and manage different dependencies and run it in uh, a polyglot style, right, between JavaScript and Ruby and things like that. Um, other debugging capabilities that you can do basically would include, uh, say, for example, you know, you wanted to run um, a particular code and then run it um, on um, a Chrome debugger, right? So say, for example, we ran Ruby and it's a Fizzbuzz uh, code and you wanted to create a, a breakpoint and, you know, iterate through the code and things like that. So if we ran that uh, basically here uh, within this Fizzbuzz application, so Fizzbuzz is, as you know, it goes through you know different uh, numbers and the mod sequence and so forth and you print it out so if you run that um over here let me exit from here so this is a bit more involved so you'll see the um you know this is basically how you'd run it in inspect mode so basically uh, graal vm has a debugger integrated with uh, chrome dev tools so so this is where you would actually go uh and you'd actually be able to go through the um direct link and if I then paste it in uh, the uh, browser window here, you'll be able to see um, that, you know, we had a breakpoint there and we can actually step through different functions uh, and things like that, right? And, uh, you know, it will give you the breakpoints and, uh, you know, accordingly the results and things like that. So you can actually debug inline uh, within Graal VM uh, into Chrome as well, not only just for uh, Ruby code, but also for different types of code, uh, for other languages and snippets and things like that as well. So that's a, uh, it's a pretty interesting area. So then after that, you might wonder that, you know, how is this useful to be doing things like, you know, more debugging and things like that as well, right? So, so say, for example, we then, uh, you have written a particular Ruby program, right? Say, for example, you've uh, generated some garbage over time. Uh, here's a sample Ruby program. And um, if you run like, you know, all these JVM languages like JRuby and so forth, you, know, you will see that you want to be able to know more about the underlying objects, more information about what's happening and so forth. So if you did that, um, you know, you are able to run, uh, you know, your J Visual VM uh, and uh, behind the scenes. So Visual VM is kind of like a monitoring, uh, you know, tool that you can do debugging and so forth. It's actually pretty integrated with uh, Graal VM these days. So you can actually run that. So once that's done, so let me run that. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, it pops up, right? So you got the uh, whole, um, um, 
interface for Visual VM and so forth. So we've got the PID, but you know, let's make that live, right? So we we run, you know, obviously a simple application behind the scenes um, and things like that. And then we are basically going to be doing the Ruby uh, program to generate some garbage over time. So let's run that. So this is a uh, render um, Ruby code. And so, uh, you know, once that's completed, let's run that. Uh, this is actually uh, generating some uh, area so that on this. So once that happens, you'll be able to see, you know, details on some of the um, uh, heap dump analysis and things like that. So this is part of the Truffle framework earlier you saw in the architecture. So you can analyze your, your languages that are running on Truffle and things like that. So once we go back into your Ruby uh, and you're able to see that, uh, you know, you open that and things like that, you're able to see uh, and monitor uh, you know, your applications, uh, you know, what is CPU consumption, GC activity, and things like that as well. So you can even go down to um, your meta space, you know, deep dumb analysis and things like that. Look at your threads, uh, live threads, and also do things like polyglot sampling and so forth, right? So that's pretty interesting. So you're able to look at your, um, you know, Ruby uh, in Visual VM, right? So and the Truffle framework will, will give you that kind of debugging and analysis uh, capabilities and, and things like that as well. Um, let's uh, now run a, um, a, I'm just going to stop, you know, if there's any questions, feel free to stop because, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of keep it more interactive for you guys uh, if you have any questions. But the next demo I was basically going to show is on the uh, benchmark, right? So we're going to be running uh, a benchmark. Um, and what we're going to be doing here is um, we have a benchmark. We're going to be using uh, op caret. Um, if you know, it, one is a, a gaming application uh, that uh, we run it with Ruby and with Truffle Ruby and then with uh, obviously a regular Ruby on, on my Mac. And then the second one is kind of like more of a benchmark type of application, right? So, so if we run that, uh, you'll be able to see that, um, let me exit out of this. Um, and so on here, you see that uh, if my Java dash version is, uh, uh, yeah, so basically my Ruby version here would be, what's my, um, so here, obviously I'm just using Ruby 2.3.7. Um, you see it here, uh, the Ruby version uh, would be your Truffle Ruby, right? With the Graal VM EE native. So if we ran this kind of benchmark here, so this benchmark is um, a, um, you know, uh, basically you have a lot of transactions and iterations per second uh, going on behind the scenes. And you'll be able to have and see a comparison between the two, right? So if you ran this uh, Ruby benchmark here versus um, your Ruby benchmark um, with Truffle Ruby, you'll see a lot more different types of, you know, to the hundreds of thousands of uh, iterations that you can get in the same warming up versus calculating and things like that. So it uses um, you know, WRK tools behind the scenes and so forth for performance analysis. And so this will exit out from here and that's kind of like a printout and then generate a dot out file and so forth. Uh, then we compare it here, you know, we run the same, um, you know, basically Ruby benchmark um, on uh, Graal VM native and you'll be able to see, you know, uh, a larger, uh, obviously the number of uh, iterations and so forth going up in terms of uh, into the, you know, 30, 40, 100,000 and so forth, and 689,000 and also into the millions of it in terms of seconds. So that's um, like a simple um, benchmark comparison, right? So it's using some uh, synthetic workloads. So you can actually follow uh, how I basically did this over here. Uh, what it was, was how it can really speed up the Ruby code, right? So yeah, what we did is we used Truffle Ruby together with uh, GraalVM Enterprise, right? So this was kind of like the benchmark that we ran. And um, basically it's a comparison of, you know, MRI and 2.5.3 JRuby. Um, that's the community and then the enterprise and so forth. So this goes into the 1 million renders per second, right? Almost 31 times faster uh, and so forth. So you can run a lot of that code in parallel and, and things like that. So that's a um, pretty interesting one. Uh, another one that I had pre-recorded earlier, which I think is kind of cool, um, is uh, Ruby game, right? So this is something that we did uh, when we were in Japan. We were showing this demo. Um, if you're interested, I can also share this. Uh, but, you know, just sort of amusement and so forth. So this was um, 
something I had prepared. Uh, yeah, I did it about uh, exactly, let's say, like one, one and a half years ago. So, um, so you're running um, Op Carrot um, with Ruby and with uh, Truffle Ruby. And when I started, uh, basically what happens is it will start the game. There is a Landmaster. You know, you can go in there and play the game and, and start it and things like that. But this is calculating the frames per second and comparing it, um, you know, with Ruby and uh, with Truffle Ruby, right? So I've started this on, on one screen and then another screen, and then, you know, it props up these, uh, these windows, right? So you can see the speed up on the right-hand side. Uh, on the left-hand side, kind of frozen and that. But you imagine and see what happens on the right. Isn't that pretty cool? So, you know, so you can actually, it'll hit like 138, 148 frames per second uh, versus your, um, uh, what's on the, or your regular Ruby and things like that. So these are just some of the different types of uh, examples, right, that you are able to run um, accordingly and so forth as well. So, uh, you know, keeping it very interactive and so forth. You can also build in your own profilers. Uh, if you wanted to run Truffle Ruby, for up carrot and look at your profiling, um, you know, what was the self time and also the locations and things like that as well. You can actually run that, um, no issues. Um, there's also a Rails uh, simpler benchmark, right? Uh, and you can actually get it from GitHub. Uh, they did a lot of benchmarking on the Ruby 3x3 and they use uh, you know, WRK for a lot of the benchmarks. So Ruby concurrency and you know, various configurations and things like that as well. So when in this uh, benchmark, so we also had another benchmark on the Rack app um, and Puma, there's widely used uh, web server and things like that. The other one, ERB template is more from your C Ruby. So all tests passed on the, um, for Truffle Ruby, right? For Rubies, we use uh, C Ruby 2.6 and then Truffle Ruby in, uh, in JVM mode, right? Concurrency settings were, um, you know, in, the term, in terms of uh, three different ones. And there were request threads, and then the rest were all on uh, the same numbers for all. So we had the same number of requests and server threads, and then we avoid uh, extra processing and so forth, and we maintain one connection right on the server side. Processor used for this particular one uh, was AMD, and uh, it was from frequency uh, scaling, and Turbo Boost was enabled. And we ran for 10 seconds. So this was a, a Rack and Rails application. Some were ideal. And for real world, we encourage you to test it in your uh, environment. So here were some of the uh, requests per second differences on the server threads. So we see C Ruby, look at Truffle Ruby, and uh, you know the difference uh, becoming even larger and larger uh, for um, you know the threads over time and things like that as well as successive runs and so forth. Right. So um, almost 120,000 um, you know requests per second. And then similarly for uh, when we are able to see it with the processes and things like that, here are the differences uh, accordingly, right? So the advantages of threads over processes is that, you know, you don't need to have the JIT in the program at once, uh, not once per process. You know, you can have common data structures and they can be guaranteed, um, you know, uh, no fork pitfalls. And then you can have faster communication between your threads and your processes. And you can synchronize when if you have these needs and so forth. So here were some of the results with uh, Truffle Ruby with uh, compared to C Ruby threads and processes. You can see that difference. Um, and then some of the future work that we are looking at uh, includes, um, you know, running with the, you know, C extension lock disabled since it is okay to run that in parallel. Um, and also for, you know, your Ruby threes um, reactor, other three C extensions and other thread safe uh, running in parallel. And then for Truffle Ruby, it only matters that if it's synchronized and so forth. So, you know, the Rails benchmark uh, ran on uh, Truffle Ruby uh, with a higher uh, limit and the def default is sometimes uh, low for Rails and so forth. So, so splitting avoids some of these calls and so forth as well. So this is uh, this, uh, this rack on Rails, um, you know, applications were, um, you know, our, you know, in a kind of ideal setting, right, that we did, there were some conditions and assumptions, but we encourage you to try it in the real world, right, for your, and share your results and, and how you are doing it. The best way to get started with Truffle Ruby is just to download GraalVM. You go in there, uh, download GraalVM, um, run it uh, just like I did earlier. And uh, all you do is, uh, you know, you can have the RVM, your Ruby install, and you do a GU, and you're already up and running. I'm using 20.2 and things like that as well. So that's, uh, you know, basically just uh, kind of like a um, high level. We've got uh, some other 
I had also some other uh, basic uh, demos that were running in line and, and things like that as well. But, uh, you know, that gives you kind of an idea on, on where we are at and, uh, you know, where you can basically go um, uh, with, with uh, Truffle Ruby and uh, Graal VM for Ruby. And also then if you're looking at polyglot code. So in, in, in kind of like a summary, you know, Graal VM has this kind of three different areas, right? You think about it, the polyglot, where you can have the polyglot um, context for different languages where you can mix and match. Uh, earlier, what you saw like JavaScript and Ruby, that kind of demo. And then, of course, you can run it in uh, GIT, which is your just-in-time compiler. But GraalVM gives you that uh, modern compiler, uh, which is enhanced version compared to the regular ones or that you see on JDK and so forth. So this has all those optimizations like inlining, partial escape analysis, uh, and partial evaluation built in. And then um, the other ones, like um, uh, in GraalVM, I hit out of time native mode, and that's why you see those startup times and the performance and things like that going faster. So the best uh, source for all the, all the um, how to run Ruby within a GraalVM um, enterprise is kind of like in this docs here, right? So you can actually uh, find out how to install it, how to run it, and what are some of the options available to you. Um, and, uh, you know, what are the options, flags, and things like that. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, it can take you accordingly there. So you can see your, the types of versions, um, you know, uh, how you would run the code faster earlier. We saw that uh, running in parallel, how to boot it uh, in less application time, how to run um, and execute it, see extensions in a managed environment. Um, and also there's some security uh, aspects to it. And you can also have more, uh, tooling, right? For example, if you run this, this was the dev tools earlier that I showed, uh, and you're able to do uh, debugging using Chrome dev tools. So the interoperability is where you can run it in polyglot context. I mean, it makes and match between uh, different types of languages. So here you've got to require JSON. I did an earlier one, which is a bit, a bit more simpler, but you know, you would get results like you run it in this dash dash JVM if you want to run a polyglot program, and then you'll be able to see hello world like that. Several other command line options that you wanted to be able to um, look at would include, uh, you know, all these switches and arguments that you can use and, um, and so forth. So you can, um, uh, if, if you're looking at it from a JRuby uh, perspective or MRI perspective and other options, then you can actually look at that and there are very much details on VM options and, uh, and so forth and other uh, configuration options that you can run, and of course, debugging and, and tracing and, and so forth as well. So that's pretty much what we are, what I have. Um, hope I didn't go too fast, but you know, I wanted to uh, you know go less on slides and keep it more interactive for you guys. So um, you know, keep the floor open for any questions you guys have. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan. Anybody got questions? Um, no, maybe not. Uh, curious is how how um I I actually I'm curious about the polyglot uh thingy. Like I'm yes. I'm wondering like is there a lot of uh uh take up rate for that feature and what what do people usually use that feature for? Yeah, I mean um performance is one aspect um you know that people are doing it, but then polyglot what we're seeing a lot of people have specialized skill sets so. You don't have to, um, the word is, um, you know, as you're crossing boundaries between different types of languages, those um, you can, the, the, the cost of, of, co of call access could become high, security vulnerabilities and so forth. So we've had um, some customers uh, start exploring Polyglot. You know, some were looking at it from a machine learning with, 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 uh, with you know, displaying plotting graphs and so forth. So then they use special languages for each one of those and they wanted to all run it on single runtime. So a lot of developer productivity was one angle, uh, specialization was another angle, and um, you know, parallelism and cost was uh, kind of yet another angle uh, where people were um, going into the um, you know, specifics on code efficiency and, and so forth as well, right? Yeah, actually true. Now that you mentioned, like I can imagine if, if all the data science stuff is on Python, and then people want to run a Ruby web server, and then like Rails, then potentially they can combine like cross languages. Yes, oh. and it's, you're right. And it's as easy as, you know, 
all you have to do is basically just this polyglot.eval, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you're able to then, uh, you do that and you can have this concept of host and guest languages. And there's a lot of um, options that you can do and mix and match this polyglot uh, languages. So this is a very simple one here, right? We just run Ruby. We can also have like within Java, you're calling Ruby, third party uh, or between R where you want to plot something and like you said and so forth as well. So um, it's, it's very flexible and it's, you know, you get that same memory address space and so forth. So, you know, you don't have to um, be, you can then leverage all those optimizations behind the scenes as well. So, hmm. yeah. and what, what do I want to ask? I have another question. All oh, right. Uh, not sure whether you mentioned before it is truffle will be like a compound thing, like you compile it and then you run it, or is it like run like real, uh, like real time running? Kind yeah, of so like here, yeah. So here we have it. Um, you know, in this, uh, for example, if you look at it here, uh, on this uh, particular one here. So we are using, uh, you know, we are using it as a. Um, as a uh, as part of the native image so you've got that whole aot aspect the pre-compile aspect to it so you can also run it in jit mode or you can run it in native mode so you know two options okay cool um yeah. Yeah. i don't have any other questions uh yeah. anybody else okay bye um yeah i i guess there's no question Thank you, Dillian, for your talk on Truffle Ruby today. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, thanks for thanks for the invitation. And uh, you know, um, I think um, great to hear that you know the Ruby community is really active uh, in this part of the world and so forth. Uh,